Hey, a very warm welcome back to Globetrotting. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. It would certainly help it grow and mean a lot. Committing the funds and resources to a new aircraft is hardly a minor decision. It has the potential to either be game-changing or a complete disaster. Therefore, much preparation must go into concluding, will we proceed with it or will we not? Throughout modern aviation history, we've seen many failed concepts that haven't been implemented, but equally fantastic ideas that have been successfully implemented. Aircraft manufacturers will look wherever possible to mitigate risks associated with a new plane, and in the 21st century, that's been through the development of planes in the form of a re-engine more than ever, taking a already successful aircraft and building upon it with modern advancements at typically a fraction of the cost. It can be considered a low-risk option. The pursuit of a successor to the A330 led Led to the eventual development of the A330neo, or new engine option. This wide-body aircraft, with its benefits extending beyond just the new engine, was a careful consideration by Airbus, but was it the right one? Well, first talk of a new A330 didn't actually come in the form of the A330neo, believe it or not, but rather an A330 light. This prospective aircraft formed part of Airbus's response to the 787 as they faced increasing pressures from airlines and internally to mount a response to this upcoming widebody that was enjoying a high level of success. Initially, it's important to remember that Airbus didn't see the 787 as a threat. For Airbus, while the A330 light didn't eventuate, they were aware of the potential that the A330 had as a platform to continue to see development, basically to be improved further and it could be implemented where required for decades to come. As technology advanced at a pretty rapid rate, and as evident through the eventual A320neo, some things could be taken from this and implemented on a larger scale, and be successful, with airlines that committed to the type reducing their costs quite substantially. While moving ahead with any new aircraft type would have associated risks for the plane maker, this would be considered, as I touched on right at the beginning of this video, as a more low-risk option than moving forward with, say, a clean sheet. Airbus knew an A330neo could be developed at a much lower cost and wouldn't therefore need as many orders to break even as another potential alternative. Furthermore, after the A320neo's success in the short-haul space, some customers did actually begin knocking on the plane maker's door and looking towards the A330 to evolve this further to a more modern experience. This can be seen through executive comments from AirAsia and others. But why the A330neo, especially when you have to consider that the A350 already existed in the manufacturer's portfolio at this point? And further, well, the 787 had a pretty big stronghold on the market long before the A330neo's debut. So how on earth were Airbus going to fight themselves into this? Well, we know the A350 actually initially had a Dash 800 variant. Yes, this variant never proceeded because the A330neo killed it off. Moreover, this A330neo has long been considered as a more modest alternative to the A350. See, in the case of Delta, this major, might I add, US airline utilizes both wide-body types from Airbus, but for varying purposes, and has stated on several occasions that the smaller A330neo's capabilities that are more modest is optimal for their routes that are not considered significant enough for the A350, but don't need a narrow body. This can also be felt for other airlines, with the A330neo felt at offering something a little bit different from the 787 and A350. When Airbus launched their A330neo, it was clear that they had intent to improve fuel burn by 14% and had outlined ambitious goals of 1,000 aircraft orders. One of the key points related to this aircraft and its adaptability was to be more economical on shorter routes than other existing wide-body planes. So basically, thanks to its optimal range that wasn't designed for ultra long haul flights, paired with a capacity that was larger than that of single aisle jets, 
it was a potential plane that would work for some airlines. And since this aircraft has entered service, it has been a slow, but you'd probably argue modest grower. The aircraft has received interest and can now be seen flying right around the world, but its impact certainly may not have been to the level that Airbus would have expected when it was at that critical stage of the drawing board and outlining that it wanted to achieve 1,000 orders. However, it is also a plane that didn't need to jump right off the blocks. That being said, one of the key underperformers is the A330-800. This is the smallest variant of the re-engine type that has really struggled, and that's not an understatement to attract any firm interest. It has been the larger A330-900 that has been the standout, and the only variant of interest that brings in the bulk of the orders and accounts for the most deliveries. Nowadays, when an airline considers aircraft for their future flying, the A330neo is not always pitted as an option. And why is this? Well, the industry has and will always continue to change. We'll see new trends and airlines want different things. But in this case, companies tend to lean either to the A350 or the 787 for wide body flying. Now, I'm excluding the upcoming 777X. I believe that to be on a totally different scale. And the thing is, if they require something one up on the A320neo, it is very interesting the direction that they'll head. I'll probably first look to the A321neo series, including the upcoming XLR, and pairing this type of aircraft with a wide body is really deemed to be the perfect combination for multiple airlines long-term ops. So has the A330neo failed? It's important to remember that the A330CO is actually not an old aircraft, especially since the Neo was launched only in the mid-2010s. The older model it was replacing still remains a pretty fresh option for most airlines, and if they are looking to replace this, it wouldn't be until, in some cases, the 2030s which would be 20 years after the NEO launched. And this aligns with the talk of replacement cycle, which for a lot of operators hasn't hit yet. However, in saying that, the A330neo's first 10 years in the market haven't all been that rapid, and a lot rests on the continued development of the A321neo series that I briefly touched on. Customers are frankly very happy with this and believe it to be a better solution in some cases, and that makes the A330neo not the ideal choice. Voice. As the industry has progressed in a natural direction, like I touched on, the needs for airlines have also changed. What now is on the market may not have been on the market 10 to 15 years ago and could be deemed as more ideal. The A330neo, while capable, just simply isn't favoured to the same extent that an A330co was. In saying that, I think many people would argue that it was always going to be a more niche-based plane that'll continue plodding along, orders here and there alongside deliveries. But many will argue it won't ever experience rapid orders or rapid production increases. That'll conclude today's aviation analysis right here on Globetrotting, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on the A330neo as an aircraft. How have you viewed the last 10 years, and how do you view the aircraft for the next 10? Let me know down below in the comments. Thank you very much for your support here on the channel. Subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you in a couple of days for more analysis. And flight, and we'll fly.